and download some drivers for it next time. I mean, normally it would say it doesn't recognize it, right? It does no drivers available or something. Yeah. So it seems kind of odd. But um, I'll just uh, I'll just log in here real quick. And sure. Can you sit at the front of the class so I can escape if you need? Yeah, please. Okay. Right. So you'll go over to the site, right? Okay. Okay. So. Um, Folks, last time we had talked about um, the use of uh, a hybrid modeling technique involving uh, decision analysis and system dynamics modeling, although it applies more broadly to uh, simulation modeling of general sorts, dynamic modeling, whether it's in agent-based modeling or system dynamics. There was a specific tool uh, built by a member of this class that actually works with uh, Benson. Within today's class and the next one or two classes, we're going to be talking about trade-offs between the sorts of modeling we've seen, sort of reflecting on the sorts of modeling we've seen thus far. And uh, we're going to further be talking about hybrid strategies um, of a broader sort. So we saw this the hybrid between um, what's uh, typically not considered a dynamic modeling strategy, uh, a strategy that uses decision trees on the one hand, and dynamic models. We're going to be looking at hybrids between these different types of dynamic modeling. So we'll look at models that build together stocks and flows with agents, that build together discrete <coughs> event simulation with agents. And uh, we may even look at something that, that involves all three. Um, today, I wanted to specifically talk some about trade-offs. There's no question that while we can create hybrid models that build together um, different components of a, of, a, of a single model with each different component coming from a different, using a different sort of modeling, it's important when we do that to have some sense as to some of the trade-offs that apply. Why would you choose a component made um, using one sort of modeling or using a different sort of modeling? It's important to have a sense of their, their natural strengths and natural limitations um, so that you can more artfully combine them. Combine them within a given model and combine them within a modeling project that might involve a suite of models that work together to, to lend insight. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, uh, I appreciate the, the prompt there. I'm going to go and start uh, desktop sharing here. And, oops, uh, share desktop. Okay, okay so um, within today's, uh, today's lecture, we're going to be talking about some of the trade-offs and limitations between agent-based and aggregate modeling. I'd like this to be a, um, a more interactive session with the class and would encourage all of you to speak up, ask questions, because there's going to be a lot of material here that are based on my many years of experience working with both sorts of modeling. Some of it will no doubt be cryptic at times. Some of it will be um, something you might want to challenge. So I would welcome uh, you know, discussion about any of the points we're going to be discussing today. Um, we will be looking at this question of trade-offs from a variety of angles. We'll be looking at it from the angle of um, uh, sort of the its impact on policy questions we can ask, on accuracy of the simulation, on um, uh, ability of the simulation to be used by a wide, to be built by a wide variety of types of modelers. And a variety of other criteria, includes, uh, including sort of limitations and the insights you can get from a model. So um, I should note within this presentation, broadly speaking, I've concentrated on sort of two important sorts of differences. One that are more um, inherent or fundamental about the sorts <coughs> of modeling. The others that are more based on the current the current state of the art when it comes to um, software support for these sorts of modeling. What, what do tools out there support? What do they happen to support well? What do they happen to support in a limited way? 
which is important from a pragmatic perspective, although in the long term, I'm, no, I'm, I'm sure that it will be evolving quickly. So I'm going to be concentrating first on this inherent side, um, uh, talk about some of, the, um, some of the issues. So just as a sort of overall uh, reminder here, we're talking about two, two separate sorts of modeling. Our focus is, is broadly uh, within the health area here. So uh, firstly, sort of aggregate models, uh, where we're characterizing them uh, using differential equations. Population is divided into two or more state variables, or stocks, according to attribute. Think S, I, and R, for example. Um, and in this case, typically the number of state variables and the number of parameters is much, much less than the population size. So if we were to count the number of people in the population being simulated, the state of the simulation, the, the amount of information that need, would need to be captured to sort of save away and then later restart the simulation is, is much, much smaller than the population. It might be three numbers, S, I, and R, for the number of people in each of those categories, and the sort of most pure example for a um, classic SIR model. Um, even if we're going and we're breaking the population, say, down by sex or by, gen or by uh, ethnicity or by age, Typically, the number of state variables will be much less than the size of the population. Okay. More recently, um, we've looked at, uh, there's been an advent of, of individual-based models, and that's the type of model we've spent most of our time in the course thus far, whether it's at a discrete event uh, formulation or in an agent-based formulation. And here, there's less of a strong established tradition about how to describe individual behavior. Um, while stocks and flows, in other words, differential equations are really the classic mechanism for aggregates, aggregate models with variations like delay differential equations, etc. For individual based models, there's more variability in how you describe things. <coughs> but each individual here is evolving. And here, the number of state variables and parameters is basically proportional to the size of the population. We have sort of a similar amount of state to save away, similar to the population size. So these are quite, quite different sort of granularities of specification of the population. We have here on the left an aggregate model with four stocks, and on the right a model where individuals are depicted in nodes and connected up in, in networks. So. From my perspective, the selection of granularity is a, is, a, is a function of the question that we're asking, not of the true nature of the system. Um, it's true certain, certain aspects of a system might lend us towards one approach or another. For example, if we're, if we're modeling water, water resources, there's not a lot of compelling reason to capture things at an at a individual based level with individual water molecules or what have you. Um, it makes sense to capture at an aggregate level. But if we're dealing with uh, human populations or populations of, of, of animals, um, we, we're often going to be finding our research question, um, what we're seeking to achieve as, as really shaping what, how we build our models. And I'd like to distinguish here in a very important way between two different uses of models you'll see well represented in the literature. The first of them focuses on modeling for qualitative insight. This is a, a type of modeling where we're trying to get some insight that might explain certain types of behavior we're seeing in the external world. And we're really using the model as kind of a broad thinking tool. We're not interested in the model replicating in a very close way some particular external circumstance so much as to help us think through what dynamics would be expected under certain types of circumstances. What broad features of a situation that we know are going on in the world um, might introduce new dynamics and what, what sort of dynamics might they be? What might on a broad level really accelerate the diffusion of computer viruses into a corporation, for example, or, or what, what things might really um, cause uh, a big gain in terms of lowering the burden of, of uh, diarrheal diseases following a natural disaster. 
um, what sort of things might make a big difference versus a, a smaller difference, how soon might they make a difference. These are sort of rough, um, rough questions that we're interested in articulating without a model claiming to be a depiction of a particular circumstance with great uh, detail. The other use of modeling you'll see is modeling to quantitatively predict. And the prediction that's being made here might be a forecasting of what's likely to happen going forward. More likely it's to be a, a comparison between outcomes of interventions. So if we do this, if we do that, what sort of gains should we expect to see in quantitative terms? Is this policy 10% better than this other policy? Um, and uh, when will they cross? We're, we're hoping to get very detailed uh, understanding of the trade-offs, perhaps cost-effectiveness analyses, for example. And here we're looking for a detailed characterization of the situation. If we aspire to quantitatively understanding those trade-offs in great detail, we better have backed this model up with quite a bit of detail about the external situation. So in the first case, we're looking at models that are, in the word of uh, my colleague Carl Simon from, from uh, University of Michigan, caricatures. They're models that sort of roughly capture the essential features of the external situation in enough ways that we can kind of use them as thinking tools to explore, explore trade-offs at a qualitative level. In the latter case, we're really looking for a rich, robust model. Within your projects for this course, I've included, I've suggested that many of you focus at least initially and for, for many throughout the entire project on this first element. And it's very important to reflect on this because people get caught up, predicting the agent-based modeling world, they get caught up with the assumption that you're trying to quantitatively predict things, that you're trying to understand um, and, and very precise ways trade-offs between interventions so the exact um, amount of, of, of uh, health burden reduction to expect. Whereas really models can be very helpful with uh, only a modest amount of data for the first of these. I should note the system dynamics community, the community building stock and flow models has traditionally emphasized more the first of these. They've emphasized more this sort of modeling for qualitative insight. And that is reflected in the simpler nature of many of the models used, the fact that we have fewer stocks. I should note also that those simpler models are not only made sort of allowed according to the first of these, they're actually valuable because often the learning you'll get out of a very, very simple model is more direct in the sense that you'll you'll be able to understand more readily what's going on in that model compared to if it has lots and lots of moving parts. So if you're modeling for learning, it lends itself to very simple models, rough, rough, rough data, and qualitative insights. Um, if you want quantitative predictions, you're often dealing with quite complex, sophisticated models that are very fine-grained um, depiction of the external world. What you don't want to do is use the first type of model to try, to try to quantitatively predict. That can get you into real trouble. If you're building this first sort of model, you use it in its own, <coughs> for its own terms, in terms of qualitative insights. Don't use it as a vehicle for qualitative, for quantitative prediction. And uh, for those of you who go on to apply modeling after this course, you'll find that this is one of, your tension, uh, one of the tensions you'll face. Because if you build the source, first sort of model here, you'll find there's pressure to use it quantitatively, to try to use it to give very quantitative trade-offs. Because after all, the first sort of model, just like the second, gives numbers out. And someone who isn't familiar with modeling may think it's just as good as the second sort of model for quantitative insight. You have to know the limitations of the model, though. OK, the other issue here is that when I say granularity selection is problem-specific, you may have a situation where there's obvious, obvious features of the situation that you might model, for example, as agents. But you need, to, you need to question that impulse. First of all, you may want to capture some things within those agents. Don't assume that, for example, the person level or the animal level 
um, characterization of behavior at that level is necessarily the lowest level at which you'll focus. You may want to have rich dynamics within the context of an individual in some cases. In other cases, you may benefit from a, um, from a higher level representation. And again, the key thing here is that often you gain great insight from very simple models. Gas laws, for an example, are, are a very compelling example um, where you can get a lot of insights from rough high level models rather than trying to model uh, a gas at an individual molecular level, as is the, the focus of, of lattice gas models, for example. So we have to be careful in an agent-based context of, of thinking we're modeling the world from the bottom, bottom up because we're modeling uh, you know, from the person level on up. Um, you, you, need to, you need to challenge your notion of the scope of the model. A single person is indeed a natural locus of description. It's kind of a natural focus. A person presents for cares, lives or dies, has you know, coupled internal systems, but the world doesn't have a bottom here. And, and um, you often will want to be thinking about what is the scope of our person level model in a very active way. Don't assume that you know, um, there's not many processes operating below that level. Sometimes there are. So I'd like to talk here about contrasting benefits. So I'm going to cut to the chase here and talk about benefits, and then we'll go into some of them in more detail. So as far as I see it, um, there's some, some real trade-offs between individual-based models and aggregate models. Um, some real situations where each confers benefits. And let's, let's talk about those. Um, let's talk first about aggregate models, aggregate stock and flow models. Frequently, these sort of models allow for, number one, easier construction. In a process we'll talk about within another probably week or two's time, they allow for calibration that's easier, matching up a lot against a lot of historic data because there's fewer, fewer parameters that need to be adjusted often and they allow for somewhat easier parameterization. Most importantly, arguably, they, are, they allow for formal analysis. So we can analyze an aggregate model at a mathematical level in a very rich way. This is not something I've, I've focused on within this course, but it's a very powerful feature of stock and flow models and differential mo equation models uh, in general. We can, we can actually uh, leverage a whole battery of techniques from um, applied mathematics to analyze these models. We can, we can identify their equilibria, the points where they're in this sort of balance. We can identify the stability of those equilibria. We can use techniques such as control theory to try to optimally select a policy that varies based on the observed external circumstances within the model. For example, that selects the best policy for treatment based on the stage of the epidemic. That, that adjusts vaccination based on observations of how many people are getting sick in the first few weeks of the vaccination rollout, etc. And often for aggregate models, there's easier understanding. This is, uh, this is a, a, a function both because the model has fewer parts in it, and therefore there's fewer things to look at. But number two, it's because the model allows you to run it very quickly. And so you can end up exploring a lot of scenarios very quickly interactively. And that can lend itself to sort of an understanding, a gut feel for why it's behaving the way it is. In terms of performance, um, uh, aggregate models have, have vastly lower cost often to run them. They're far, far quicker. And no matter how big the population is, the model's runtime is basically the same. W population multiplied by 10, multiplied by 100 or 1,000, it doesn't care. It's just numbers, a count of S, a count of I, a count of R for an SIR model. Just the number. Just another number. And it can compute with large numbers as quick as with small numbers. Um, there's less pronounced stochastics here um, at an aggregate level. So often we're less inclined to have to run a Monte Carlo ensemble 
uh, something again we'll be getting to, but running the model again and again and again with different um, random, random number sequences. And there's often qu quicker construction and run time, so there's more time for understanding and refining the model, <coughs> for pushing its boundaries in some ways. By contrast, for individual based models, let's talk about some of their trade offs. So, first of all, we can build individual based models that often offer much higher fidelity to certain sorts of situations. We can more readily represent, for example, um, exact aging times within an individual based model, progression of cohort in terms of aging, very precisely. Whereas if we have an aging chain made up of first order delays and aggregate models, things tend to get smeared out. We can represent, we can represent history dependent characters of individual dynamics in an individual based model in a way we can't with an aggregate model. We can ha make a person's trajectory within an individual based model depend upon their birth weight. Whereas all we could do with an aggregate model is kind of classify into broad categories of birth weight, unless we want the model size to explode. Individual based models do allow for stronger support for highly targeted policy planning. Let's make this interactive. Why do I say individual based models will better support highly targeted policy planning? So policies which are, which are very, very specific to individuals. How would that be enabled by an individual based model? Can anyone say? Special delivery. Thank you very much. Um, so how, how would this be enabled by an individual based model? Why would I say you could, you could have more highly targeted policy planning? Okay, and this reflects the fact that often within an individual based model we can represent a tremendous amount of heterogeneity. Characteristics of individuals that might be glommed together within an aggregate model, all just put into the S stock or the I stock. There's characteristics, maybe it's their age, maybe it's their sex, maybe it's their ethnicity, but maybe it's things like their history of past infections, or maybe it's their, the particulars of where they live within a landscape, or their connection networks to other people. We can represent aspects of context much more richly. How's the audio, by the way? Very bad. Oh, very bad, eh? Very bad. Huh. Um, this one? Okay, do you want me to unplug it? Yeah. Okay. 